naturally impressed with our department and our resources. I encourage you to come to me afterwards, after the event. I will answer all the questions that come across your mind. Uh, anyway, uh, tonight we have a very interesting topic and we have a very interesting speaker uh, who uh, happened to be professional educator and uh, amateur photographer, but come on, amateur. Uh, so tonight we are going to learn, I think, a lot of things about uh, wildlife photography and maybe something else. Please welcome Joshua Smalley and his presentation. Thank you. thank you. First of all, thank you for the honor of coming here and presenting to Lena it's all and pleasure. Natalia. Thank you so very much. It's a great venue. It's a good place for all kinds of people. As you know, you come to these presentations all the time, so it's fantastic. Um, I have a lot to cover in a short period of time today, tonight, so I'm going to go fairly quickly. And if uh, you miss something, it's okay. I have a card here and on paper also where you can put your email down. And if you write your email after the presentation, I will give you all these slides so you can go back and cover something if I go too quickly. A number of these slides also for tonight for my presentation are about um, like technicalities and photography. And I might go very quickly through that because the focus tonight is wildlife photography not necessarily like basics of photography. So, and I know some of you, and maybe most of you aren't used to photography, and so maybe that's new to you as well. And if it is, go ahead and uh, look at my presentation, write your email down, and I will send it to you. You can do your own uh, research and preparation. So, the topic for tonight is wildlife photography. What I've learned, um, been lots of places, Lots of different countries with wildlife photography and I've made a lot of mistakes and that's how you get better is making mistakes and see what doesn't work and make a plan to improve. So let me give you the overview of what I'm going to talk about tonight. This is a photo from right here in Belarus. Uh, this is a wolf that I was able to photograph in the Nalaboki forest. This photo here also is the framed version of, of that photo. Just recently, got this uh, just a few months ago. So. It was a fantastic experience, and uh, Belarus has much to offer in terms of wildlife. We'll talk about that a little bit later. All wildlife or photos you will see tonight are my personal photos. You'll see some other photos that maybe other people took of me, but uh, all the wildlife photos are mine. I'm going to talk very briefly about my experiences so you know where I've been. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of quality photography, like I said. I will go quick. And then we'll dive in to wildlife photography. What is unique about it, uh, composition and story, how to tell a story with your camera, how to think about light, how to think about angles, the eyes of the animal and the background, uh, wind, especially if you're on foot, behavior of animals, what to look for, different seasons for animals. We'll talk about timing and patience. Some of you were watching the video at the beginning and I pointed out one moment. Um, I said, pay attention to this. We'll talk about patience later on. It's important. And then some settings on your camera and tips and tricks that I've learned over the years to help you with wildlife photography if you ever have the opportunity to do so. Um, I'm going to talk about safari vehicles versus being on foot. And the benefits, the pros and cons of both. Um, here in the Nalaboki Forest, you can actually go out and explore on foot. Uh, there are some experts right here in Belarus who can help you with that and facilitate research and photography. It's pretty exciting. We'll talk about safety. If you're going to be on foot and even inside a safari vehicle, safety is absolutely important. Finally, there will be questions and answers at the end. So if you have questions, I'm going too fast or something, please hang on to them. There'll be plenty of time at the end for questions. Any questions right now, though, before we start? 
Perfect. All right. So I have a number of photos. We have Belarus and we have, I think, mostly Kenya in here. Yeah, it's Kenya and Belarus, but you're going to see photos from Sri Lanka and India and all over the place. So let's get started with that. My experiences. First of all, India. This is my first time doing wildlife photography in India. I made a lot of mistakes. But learn from it. It doesn't look like it, but Photoshop is a magical thing. Uh, one thing I learned about was uh, shutter speed with a long lens. When you have a big heavy lens, you really need to be thinking about shutter speed. And I made a lot of mistakes on this trip uh, and learned quite a bit from it. But India was fantastic. Sri Lanka got a little bit better. Photos were a little bit sharper. Better composition, better story. And in Kenya, many of these photos you see here, <clears throat> I gained more of Kenya. Uh, a lot of people talk about this photo. They, they love this photo. I did not bring a print with me tonight, but uh, very fortunate on that one. Again, it's about strategy. We'll talk about this later. South Africa, Costa Rica, and Belarus. And I want to highlight Belarus because that's where we are at here tonight. Uh, we have a wolf here, we have a fox, and that's crazy me, I guess I could be an animal. <laughs> I'm dressed, this is what I look like when I go out in the wild. Uh, deer, lynx, I actually had an opportunity to get a photo of a lynx, the ghost of the forest here, was so fortunate. Bison, black adder, black grouse, capricelli in the upper left hand corner. So, beautiful nature and wildlife here, just an hour and a half drive from Minsk. So something to think about as we're talking tonight about wildlife photography, how close the opportunities like this are to you. Okay, so now this is the part where I'm gonna go really fast and give some basics on photography. So I wanna get past that and go to wildlife photography. Is that okay? Okay, real quick. Shutter speed. You need to know about the shutter speed of your camera. You need to learn how to manipulate your settings and make sure that you're making good decisions about shutter speed. The last thing you want is a blurry wildlife photo unless you're doing it on purpose to show motion. So this is a critical thing. Basically as the number goes higher and higher and higher, less light is being let into your photo, but moving things are not blurry. That's the basic story. ISO, this is light sensitivity in your sensor. So basically the rule for this is we want to keep the number as low as possible because the higher it goes, if you look at the example, it gets kind of sandy and grainy in your photo. So you want to make sure that you keep the number as low as possible. You might ask, why would I ever put the number high if it ruins my photo then? The reason is because if my shutter speed is really fast and there's a little bit of light coming in, I need more light and I will have to use my ISO and put the number higher to bring more light in. This is again, these are the basics, something that you can look up on your own and study tutorials about. A little more complicated topic, aperture, otherwise known as f-stop. It's the, in your lens, how much light is being let through, through a hole, and basically the lower the number, represented in an f number there, the lower the number, the bigger the opening, more light comes in, but in doing so, this, the area of focus is limited. Can I use one of you as a volunteer real quick? All you have to do is stand up for a second. Is that okay? Is that okay? Yeah. Just stand? Okay, yes, perfect, perfect. Okay, so if you're an animal in the wild and I have my, yes, both of you, we have two animals in the wild, yes, perfect. And I'm shooting with F1.4. It's really good because there's lots of light. But the problem is, if I'm shooting from here, the amount of 3D space that will be in focus is like this much. So if she moves, this animal moves, not an animal, if you move <laughs> a little bit, now she's going to be not in focus because the 3D space where this focus is, according to the aperture, is really tiny. But the, if I turn the number higher, F8, let's say, then the 3D space opens up. It's wider. It's like from here all the way to the wall. And animals can move in this space, and they stay in focus. The consequence of putting the number higher, lower light. And we always need light in our photos. Please give them a hand. Thank you. <clears throat> that was a whirlwind for something that takes years to learn and practice. 
So if you need to go back and restudy this and on your own, Google it and practice, please do so. I just want to touch on the basics. We're talking about some of the settings in our camera. I also want to jump very quickly through some basic concepts about light, a couple other concepts about composition as well. Light is absolutely important, especially in wildlife photography. We're going to go a little bit deeper in it a little later in the presentation, but basically the question you need to ask yourself is, what time do I go out? What's the best time for wildlife photography? Well, midday. How many think midday is a perfect time to go out for wildlife photography? Right in the middle of the day, the sun is out, it's lit up. Good time? A few people have voted yes, okay. How about morning? Some people say morning is good. Morning's good, okay, some more people voting for morning. How about evening? Some people say evening's good. Okay, so we have this mix. We'll talk in more detail about which one's the best and why. We'll talk about it in terms of the golden hour or the golden window. And those of you who said morning and evening, you were right. <laughs> but also midday can be fortunate as well. We can be lucky in the midday, but the best time is that golden hour. We'll talk about that a little bit later. How about if it's cloudy or overcast? You know, is this good photography or not for, and for wildlife? How about if the sun or the light is directly overhead looking down? Is this good or bad light? These are questions we'll ask. I will go in more detail later <coughs> in the presentation. Basic composition. This is, again, I'm going very quickly through this part. This is something that you can study on your own with more time. I want tonight's focus to be on wildlife photography. But some of the basic rules of composition involve fill the frame. What that means is your subject should fill the photo. Unless you're trying to tell a story of the animal in its natural landscape, then back your zoom out but most of the time, we want to fill the subject in the photo. Next, crop and recompose correctly. So after you've taken the photo, you're cropping it. You want to do it wisely thinking about your composition. Recompose means you have your camera, you focus, and then you move your camera a little bit to put the animal where you want it in the image. That's what recomposing is. So be aware of that. Interesting textures. Look for textures. Your, your, your eye, you're looking for in wildlife photography and in basic photography and composition. Interesting things that catch our eye, and textures is one of those things. Leading lines. And this is something where in the image there are natural objects or things that lead to the subject. Sort of a leading line there with the cheetah, with the rope that it's chasing and its tail. Those lines kind of lead to its face. High contrast, so the monkey's dark face against the light creamy green background. That's good contrast. <clears throat> no distracting backgrounds. We'll have a slide later where you'll see lots of distracting backgrounds. It's no good. In fact, the tiger has some distracting grass behind, and sometimes you can't help it, and sometimes it has to do with the settings in your camera, but for the most part, you're trying to avoid distracting backgrounds. That's the goal. And only center your animal in the photo if it is perfectly symmetrical. Now, I don't always follow this rule. It's generally a good rule to follow. Don't put your animals necessarily in the middle. We want them somewhere else in the photo. You ask why, rule of thirds. And so this rule of thirds is a basic composition rule. How many of you have heard of rule of thirds? How many of you? Oh, OK, so new concept for some people. This is why you would recompose focus and move to get things into the rule of thirds. Let me show you what it is. We're going to think in terms of the game tic-tac-toe. X is in circle. We try to get three in a row. Like that. Whenever I'm taking photos, I'm thinking of wildlife. This thing is like tattooed over my eye. I can imagine it everywhere I'm taking the photo. Why? Because I want my subject to land on one of those lines. The vertical or the horizontal. They need to be somewhere in that space, and it's for our eyes. It's just naturally what we are looking for. If you've ever seen the golden ratio before, uh, that spinning thing that goes like this, that's essentially what's happening in photography. Our eyes don't necessarily want something in the middle. They want to move through the image. So the most important places, though, are in the intersections. <coughs> that is where we really want the subject of the subject to be, the eyes in those corners, if you can help it. So one thing I'm going to tell you tonight is move. Move the camera, 
move your body so that we get the animal into these rule of thirds. Okay, and now for the basics. Now let's jump into wildlife photography. If you need to go back and review a lot of this, maybe you're brand new to photography, I encourage you to do so. Let's start off with a story. Every single photo you take that is good, it's gonna have a story. You want it to say something. Right here, and this is a family. We waited for quite a while, about an hour or so, for this moment to happen. We needed to tell the story of mom leading the children, of the babies, to, and the sub-adults, to water to drink. We wanted to show the interactions between them. This one right here on the piano. This is a sibling wrestling with the brother, stalking the foot, okay? We want stories. This one right here, mom settling down two cubs, calming them down for the evening. We're trying to look for a story. You want to think in terms of a sentence. Can this photo bring out a sentence, a statement? Questions you can ask yourself. What's happening? What's going on right here? What can I tell about this moment? And can I capture this story? What's the behavior? Animal photography is a lot different than portrait photography or landscape. You're looking for particular behaviors in animals. We'll talk a little bit later about how it has to do with your homework, your studying that you do. You need to know what the behavior of these particular animals is so you can anticipate it and take photos of those particular moments. <clears throat> Who knows what a caption is for a photo, a photo caption. You know what a photo caption is? So when we see a photo and there's a statement about the photo, that's a caption, okay? And so what you want to think when you're taking the photo is what could the caption be? What could the statement be? Look for emotion and intensity. You want those animals excited like the almost not safe for work lion photo. Uh, we have siblings wrestling with each other. We have a leopard bringing a kill down. You probably can't see this one very well, but we have a baby baboon leaping from tree to tree. We want emotion, we want intensity, we want action. And this involves patience. You need to study the animals, understand their behavior, and be patient. Wait for these moments. Look for relationships, like the two siblings there interacting. That's one of the best photos you can get in wildlife photography is animals interacting with each other. <clears throat> Lastly, we want that aww moment. Oh, it's so cute. So many people love the cute photos. So look for the cute factor. This one here with the little cub. Uh, I can't tell you how many times people see that photo. They're like, oh, that's so cute. That's perfect. That's what I want. I want that story. I want people to catch it and go, ha, this is interesting to me. We connect with it. All right, here's a bunch of story photos, in my opinion. And I'm gonna ask you, in your mind right now, come up with a caption, a one statement sentence that could describe these interactions. Think to yourself. This cheetah here and thinking, Either he's really tired, or it's like, oh my god, Burger King, please. <laughs> this one here, with the vulture who wants the meal. The, I got the, the feather, the wing, right in its eyesight, and it's looking at him like, don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. The two brothers fighting for a meal up at the top. A little gory photo, but you can... Here the two brothers, give me that, no, give me that, no, it's mine, it's mine. So this is what I'm looking for, a story. Of course, we could put almost any caption to this. This looks like an internet meme, right? Yeah, two people fighting, and <laughs> some kind of political meme on that. So, the story. A few more about story. I like, I love this one. <sighs> That's our spot right there. Oh yeah, oh my god, yes, perfect. Yeah, so we're looking for some interesting animal behavior, looking to tell a story. Very important. And the more you practice this, the better you get at it. The more you're around animals, practice at home with your cat, with your dogs. Look for certain behaviors, practice the photography, see if you can capture those moments where they're acting in a funny way that's interesting to us. Now I want to talk about light in terms of wildlife photography. 60 minute rule. 
you need to be out taking photos of animals, whether it's in safari or on foot, the first 60 minutes of sunrise and the last 60 minutes of sunset. No matter what, you need to be out at that time. You can get lucky at other times. Of course, midday you can be fortunate. But really, the most action and activity, the best moments, first 60 minutes, last 60 minutes of the day. Uh, so in order to do this, if you're on safari, one of the things I always ask and of my guide right away when I'm setting up my safaris, I must be in the Jeep at 4.30 a.m. No later, because we are driving out to the spot, and I want to be out there when it's dark and as the light is getting more and more bright. That's absolutely critical to me. Uh, I took students recently to the Nalabolki Forest, my students with me, and uh, I didn't tell them how early they'd be getting up, and we got out there, and <coughs> uh, Vadim, Professor Vadim Sudorovich, our guide and, and zoologist, he said, okay, we, we, started, uh, we started four. And my students' eyes, what, four? I thought we had, to, I, would th I was thinking we had to get up at eight, and that's too early. No, nope, 4 a.m., up, eating breakfast. And so they're like zombies. But then we saw the wolf. And I got to explain to them, we only would have seen this had we got up that early. It's the only opportunity for that. You must get up early. And you must stay out late. And a lot of people don't have that patience or that dedication. So if you're interested in wildlife photography, you must be up before they're up. Before the animals are up. Well, the animals are up all night, but before other people are up. Direction of light is important. So let's talk about different directions. 90 degree. You're looking at the animal. The light's coming in at 90 degree. It's okay, it's fine, good light. So the sun's over here, just rising or just setting because it needs to be the last 60 minutes and you're here taking this photo. That's fine. You're gonna get a shadow on half the animal's face but typically this can be a well-lit photo. This right here is a 90 degree photo. The uh, leopard cub is behind the tree so we don't really get the, sh the shadows against its body which is good. I was waiting for it to actually get to the other side of the tree so I could take the photos where I don't have these really strong shadows from the sun. But 90 degree can be good. Backlighting, that means the light is from behind. These two photos are examples of the light from behind shining against the end. This is a great opportunity for photos. And so you say to me, what do you mean? What does this even matter? The sun is where it's at. Oh well, I can't force the sun to move. Again, the, the motto this year, or this year, this presentation, the motto will be move, you move. So if you're on safari with a guide, and the guide's not moving, say, tap, 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 hi, can we go around, please? I'd like to get backlit photos. And I do this all the time with my, with my guide. So we'll stay at one place, take photos, and then move, take photos here, and then move to another place to get different lighting angles. I, I want the backlighting, it's beautiful. Also, you can do silhouettes with backlighting. Front lighting, this is front lighting. So the light is directly onto the animal. It's behind my back, which is good. It lights up the subject. It can be boring, though, at times, so you need to make sure that your composition, something we talked about earlier, needs to be really clean. The rule of thirds, no distracting back. So move around. Again, the motto, the mantra is move. You physically move to a place that is the best spot for the wildlife photography. Get up early, get up early, get up early, and stay late. So many times I've gotten the photos I wanted because my wife who's back there now, hello. <laughs> she's the one who did the video at the beginning that you saw. She's willing to do it. She's awesome. So she's like, okay, 4 a.m., we're up. So 4 a.m., we are out there. And the tourists, all the other tourists are just like just waiting up at six having tea and breakfast meanwhile we've already seen 20 different animals and they haven't even left the tent yet very important so more on light notice the silhouettes the three silhouettes that i got in backlighting this is how you get these photos this this was so fortunate to get this shot they all were afraid of a predator so they all stopped froze and looked this way gave us a chance to get some really beautiful photos the backlight on the hyenas, this golden, right, this golden red. It's early in the morning. That's how we got these photos. Very, very early. All right, angles, eyes, background. So let's talk about 
angles. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the most boring position to take a photo in the world. Right here. Why? Because we're always used to this angle, so it doesn't seem unique or different. You need to get into a different space than normal uh, in order to make interesting photos. Let's talk about this a little bit. Angles. What's the best angle? Eye to eye with the animal. So, later I'm going to talk about this a little bit, just briefly. I use this collar on my lens to help me do this on Safari. I've made a YouTube video about this. Almost every day on Safari makes a mistake. They stand. You know, there's a hole in the roof in the Safari Jeep, and they stand up and they're like, click, 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 click. Oh, look at the lion, yeah. And I'm looking at them saying, you missed it. You totally missed it. Why? Standing up in a Jeep, so already the Jeep is elevated, and then you're standing up, and you're reaching up like this, looking down, take your photo, the angle's down. Bad. What I always say is, at the very least, sit down, photo through the window. You're at least a little bit lower. What I do, and it's in the YouTube video, is I grab a hold of this collar, take my camera, put it on here, and I lean out over the window and down to get eye level with the animals. This is how I got this photo. The only way I could get this photo is if I leaned out over the vehicle. We'll talk about safety later. <laughs> you want to do this safely. We're talking about lions nearby. You don't want to fall out the vehicle, of course. But every strategy possible you can find to get eye to eye with the animal is absolutely important. It's the best angle because it seems like you're there with the animal. It invites people into the story. What are some other options? Slightly below, like uh, maybe this crested eagle here, a little bit below. Or directly above. I don't have any examples here, but I have a lot of photos from directly above looking down. It can be interesting. Like sea life, for example, if you're directly above it, it can be interesting. Directly underneath, like the monkey. I'm underneath it. Interesting angle. It's unique. When I give you the slides, if you want the presentation and write your email, there'll be a link to my YouTube video that explains on Safari how to lean over safely and get photos like that. You always want to get permission from your guide before you do something like that. Get yourself out of the vehicle. Eyes. <clears throat> Number one thing you want to get right in photography, animal photography, the eyes. If they're not sharp, photos ruined. End of story. That is the number one thing. You must always have sharp the eyes. And these are all examples where the eyes are tack sharp. In fact, in some of these, you can even see the light reflections in their eyes, which is, makes the eyes even come more to life. It's fantastic. You need to get the lock of your focus on the eyes. So if you need to practice with your camera to get your autofocusing skills increased, that's a great goal. The eyes help you tell that story I was talking about. If they're looking somewhere else, so the eyes aren't, are a little bit blurry, the nose is focused, but the eyes are blurry, it doesn't tell the story. Direct glare is always good. It's fun. When they look right at you. I mean, it's not always the best photo, but sometimes it's fun. Like the monkey in the far bottom right hand corner, staring me down. Like, what are you doing? You taking a photo of me? What? <laughs> okay. When you are recomposing, that's when you focus again and you move the camera. Or when you're just, just taking the photo. You need to think about look space or what's called breathing room with the eyes. You don't ever want the animal to be on the edge of your photo looking off the face. It's weird, right? Doesn't this look weird to you? Isn't that uncomfortable? It's like it's looking right into a brick wall. So you want space. We want the animal to have space to look into, like this one. And even this one, you could argue, is too tight. Maybe even a little bit more space would be better. So keep that in mind when we're talking about eyes and talking about composition. We want to make sure that there's room, breathing room, and space for the animal to look into. You can imagine if I crop this photo right here, how weird that would be. It's just uncomfortable for our eyes to see. All right, background. All of these photos, in my opinion, are bad because of background. There might be other things good about them. They might follow the rule of thirds, might be interesting animal behavior, but all of them have just stuff going on in the background and you cannot pay attention to the, the subject as much. 
try to avoid these kinds of situations. Well, how do you do it? Leopards in the tree. Move the vehicle, the safari vehicle. If you're on foot doing uh, uh, photos and it's a safe situation, you physically move to another spot. Well, it's always in the tree. All the leaves are in the tree. What do I do? Then you wait. And you're patient for the animal to do something else behaviorally, like come out of the tree. You can get better photos. So be thinking about your backgrounds. Backgrounds that are busy are no good. You don't want distractions or other animals in the photo, like the butt of an animal. That's really weird. You got this nice photo and then like the back end of another animal. What? <laughs> Things cut off, don't cut off arms or tails. It's weird, right? It looks kind of funky when you I mean, on occasion, you might zoom in, like here, I've cut part of this animal off. But I've, you can tell it's on purpose. I've cut a significant portion of it to tell the story and the rule of thirds here of this particular leopard and the movement here through the photo. If I would zoomed out, it's fine, it's a good photo, but it's, the background's become too distracting. It's too busy. So I zoomed in and on purpose cut off a significant portion. But if there was just a little bit of the tail cut off, it looks like an accident. It looks like I didn't do that on purpose. So this, this one works. Zoom with your feet, move with your vehicle. This is a phrase we use all the time. So move the safari vehicle, move your body so that you can get better angles. I'm gonna take camera. A lot of safari people I see on top of the Jeep, like this. Did you know you could go portrait mode and that thing that's in the way, that stick, all of a sudden it's no longer in the way if you compose it differently. All right, wind behavior seasons. Wind. Birds fly into the wind. If you know this about their behavior, they take off into the incom incoming wind. So if you want a photo of a bird taking off, you need to be facing with the wind towards the animal. Understanding the direction of the wind is really important. If it's gonna land, same thing, it's gonna be flying against the wind. So you need to move yourself to a place that will focus on that bird's landing. And then, if you, any of you hunt, any of you know this about animals, they're very sensitive to smell, most of them. So you do not ever want to be, if you're on foot, downwind from the animal. So that means, the animal's here and the wind's flowing this way. This is fine, me here, because the wind is going this way. But if the wind is going this way and the animal's there, not only does it hear me and see me, but the smell is gonna trigger either threat response or flight response from the animal. So you need to know, if you're on foot especially, where is the wind direction and be downwind from the animal to, to get photos. So study the wind and make sure you're aware of that, especially on foot. And behavior. So this is one of the biggest things I can impress on you tonight. No blurry photos and then study animal behavior. There's so many times when I'm with other photographers and they don't understand animal behavior. They're impatient, they're quick, and they want to leave, and they get bored. You gotta know what the animal's gonna do, and then you can prepare for that moment, and you're ready. And I'm usually ready to go, and they're off talking, or they've left altogether. So study ahead of time. What does, what, is it dominance time for the two males, or the males in general for the species? Is it mating season? Uh, are there new cubs at this time of the season, etc.? And then anticipate their moves. Get ready, know what they're going to do. I'm, I'm, my wife does the video while I take photos, and it took her a while, but now she has it too. She can anticipate behaviors. She knows when a particular bear is going to move this way, and she's like, yes, I'm gonna, I know where it's going already. It's important to get used to that behavior and moves. Be so, like I want to tell the story, so I'm looking for a particular behavior. Oftentimes, on I'm on safari and there's another jeep next to me and they're just like, click, 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 and I'm like, there's no story here. What are you doing? Let's wait. Be patient. Let's wait for a story. We know that in a minute, mom's going to get up, nudge her cubs, walk over this way, and greet head to head with another female. Let's wait for that moment. In fact, let's move the vehicles over knowing that it's about to happen. That's what I mean about being intentional, knowing what you're looking for. <clears throat> As I said before, look for animal relationships with each other. Seasons, you need to know the seasons. So different animals behave differently in different seasons. Bears are the big example, right? So they're hibernating and then they get up and they eat a lot 
and then they're mating, and then they start to get more lethargic and eat a little bit more right before they hibernate again. So knowing the seasons, certain animals lose their, their fur, and you need to know what, what do I want? How about the antlers, right? So you need to know the seasons and understand what it is you want in your photo and target that particular season. Target activity, behavioral patterns, patterns food, where's the food, where's the water? Speed up just a little bit, timing and patience. Over and over again, this is another thing that's really interesting, especially in Africa. There's a lot of people that come for like two days. And so they're like, quickly, I want to see everything. So they hop around. And there's so many times when my wife and I have been waiting. And those who were here before, and you saw the video of that leopard coming down under the tree, about 50 jeeps that day came by, looked, were bored because it was sleeping, and left. Came, looked, and left. Came, looked, about 50. When that leopard came out of the tree, we were the only jeep left to take photos. We knew it was nighttime, getting to be nighttime. We knew he was going to come down to hunt. We understood the behavior. We understood the lighting. We told our guide, we stay. There's nothing out there that's more interesting than what we're about to see. So 50 jeeps of people missed the opportunity, and we did not because we were patient. So that's why I have ghillie suits, because I'm going to be sitting for hours waiting for animals and patient. I know where their denning is and where they're going to be, so I wait for hours and hours. And this is the video of uh, leaning out over the Jeep, like I was explaining. I'm being patient, waiting for that moment while everyone else is standing up in the Jeep taking photos. I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. I'm looking for the behavior I want, and then I take the photo. <clears throat> Trying to speed it up a little bit. All right, let's talk technicalities a little bit here. This is now specific tips for, for wildlife photography. My gear. Uh, I don't want to go much into detail about it, but I'm a Nikon guy, so I run a Nikon D750. This is, for me, the best low-light performance I can get. The D810, I think it is, is really better as a camera, but it doesn't have, as far as I understand, better low-light performance. So I went with this camera, which was even cheaper, but it performs well. I run a Nikon 200 to 500 millimeter lens. This has served me very, very well. I recommend it. And then I also run videography with a Nikon camera. I'll be upgrading this one soon. I also have on this, for wide angles, a Tamron 24 to 70 if I want wider shots. So it's good to have a wide angle lens, like that takes big landscape shots, and a zoom lens, and maybe a video camera. Sort of the focus. Transportation, make sure you have a good bag. I have a bag that's specifically built for all this gear. Make sure that you can move your things around easily in the airport. You won't run into problems. Make sure you always bring extra batteries. And at the bottom, I make a note, SD cards, your memory cards, extra cards, extra batteries all the time. If you're on foot and or in a safari view. <clears throat> Could be good to bring a computer. If you max out your cards, you can be uploading those as you go. Autofocus, learn your autofocus system, and then I'm gonna give you one trick about autofocus. So make sure you know the autofocus system on your camera, and then I'm gonna give you a trick that most people don't know. Well, I'll, let's say a lot of people don't know, and it's really unfortunate, because it, it will radically change your photography. It's called back button focus. Right now, when we take photos, we press this, right? And as you press halfway down, you hear it go, dee -dee, right? And it locks focus. Dee -dee, dee -dee and then you take the shot by pressing the rest of the way down. The problem in wildlife photography is, I see the animal moving, I press it down, and I gotta wait, 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 I'm waiting for the behavior, I gotta hold my finger right there, and sometimes I get lazy and my finger gets back off. Or accidentally take the photo. What do I have to do again? I gotta press it again. I gotta lock it again. Well, this is the problem. So how do we avoid this problem of losing the focus? You go into your settings, and you can look this up online, you assign a back button, one of these buttons, to your focus. Now, when I'm working, I lock the focus with the back button, and I'm free to hit the shutter, and it won't impact the focus. So, lock, and then just wait. Bam, 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 take any photos I want. Whereas before, I would have to hold it, like, ah, the focus is gonna change. So, 
Back button focus, huge strategy to use in your photography. If your camera has the capability, look it up online, do it. Change or divorce uh, um, your, your actual shutter from the focus. It will help you immensely in your photography. Shutter speed, general rule, make sure the speed is two times the length of your lens. So if you have a 500 millimeter focal lens, you need at least a thousandth of a second shutter speed. Just a general rule to follow. Sometimes you can break it, but that's usually the case. Um, I think you should always shoot in continuous high speed. Some people say no, like single shots. I think you should do bursts because Sometimes you'll miss the moment. The animal's doing something, and it's better to just rapid fire and get that entire moment. Yeah, some of those photos may not be good, but you want to keep, uh, the, you want to capture the best moments. So I would do continuous high speed. Okay, a lot of photographers say shoot in AP or aperture priority mode. I disagree. I think you should shoot in manual. The reason why is if you turn your camera to the A mode or aperture priority mode, the camera controls your shutter speed. And if the camera controls your shutter speed in the first 60 minutes of sunrise or the final 60 minutes of sunset, it's going to slow down your shutter speed and you'll get blurry animal photos. So I think you should shoot in manual and control all of the settings, shutter speed, uh, aperture, and ISO at all times. So for wildlife photographer in low light, shoot in manual. Hand on top of the lens. A lot of people say, you know, if you have, like in the Safari Jeep, you have beans, and you can, like a bean bag, and you can set it here. Put your hand on, the, on top, and it steadies the lens. It's a good strategy for keeping yourself focused. Uh, use online resources like DxO Mark. They tell you, for this lens, in the lab, here's the best ranges of settings for this lens. You can look this up online before you even go out on Safari and know exactly the best settings for your piece of glass or your camera. Turn on, don't forget to turn on your image stabilization if you have it. Here, your image stabilization, IS, or your VR, uh, vibration reduction. One time I was on Safari, forgot to turn it on the whole time. The well, camera's all shaky and the photos are bad. Make sure you remember to turn on your stabilization settings if you have them on your lens. Histogram. So there's a thing called histogram. It gives a sort of graph of the... Uh, highlights and the low lights or the, the darks in your photo, use it. Because when you're in the field looking at animals, you're taking photos. It looks like on the screen it's a good photo. And then you get home and you upload it and you're like, oh no, it's horrible, oh no. So how do you prevent that? You go to your histogram, you, you hit play on your photo, you, you go to display and it shows you the histogram and you can see by a graph if you have it too bright or too dark and you can reset your exposure. So use your histogram, you can trust that in the field even if it's snowy and bright. Practice shots in changing light. So if you are there in the first 60 minutes of the sun going up and the last 60 minutes of it going down, the light is constantly changing. So you need to be constantly changing your settings. Take a photo, test it. Oh, 10 minutes later, take a photo, test it. You need to be constantly aware and ready. Use the environment to stabilize your camera. I've used rocks, I've used trees, I've used all kinds of things. So long as I keep my camera safe, my equipment safe, I have used many different settings, or many different places, uh, natural places. Use an X-strap. So a lot of people don't know this. If you're using a smaller lens, use the actual neck strap to brace it. So if I push it against me, now I actually, it, it can be sore if you do this for a long time, but now I ha have it fully stabilized. I can actually do a nice gliding smooth video if I needed to. Whereas here, your hand is loose and you're, you're tired and your elbow, so here it keeps it stable. You can't do it with a big lens because it's too heavy this far out. <laughs> you won't be able to hold it up. But that's another strategy for stabilizing your camera. Okay, tips on safaris. I'm gonna go fast with this because we need to get some Q&A. Determine what you want, agree on the itinerary, try to avoid crowds. Now, if there's crowds, it's probably because they picked the right season. So, it's kind of a toss up. I try to avoid crowds because I don't like 20 Jeeps around an animal. So, I try to go off season as long as there's still opportunities to see animals. So, 
Avoid high season if possible. Find budget options. You don't have to do an expensive safari. Most of you in here would be just, you would be surprised to see what it could cost. Get the ticket, like be looking for a cheap ticket. Go to Africa or go right here to Nalabogi Forest. <clears throat> and you could do tented safaris. It's so cheap, actually. Like instead of staying in a really nice resort, you stay in just tents in the field. Apply the techniques I've talked about even inside the safari jeep. Look out for park fees. You might get there and think, oh, this is fine, it's affordable. And then you realize, oh, $1,000 in park fees. I wasn't prepared for that. So make sure you know ahead of time the park fees for entry every day. I'm going to skip past this. If you want the slides, you can write down the email. I have a lot of things to consider when, the, when finding a guide, expectations you can set with your guide ahead of time. I want you to do this. I want you to do this. I want you to do this. Can you do this? One of the big things is I always make sure my guide knows photography. And I start quizzing the, the guide. Do you actually know photography? Because I need you when you're driving to say, oh, bad angle, let's move. So I'm, I'm not always telling the guide this information. Also, earliest possible. Agree with the guide. I want to start at 4 AM. <laughs> and hopefully the guide says yes. Uh, tips on foot. So things to do, study the area. This is more like hiking type safety. Study the animal behavior, know the season, know the weather. Tell people where you're going. Um, go with a guide if there's such a thing. Like here in the Nalaboki Forest, there's an awesome person who can help guide you around. Be sure to be very silent. Be respectful of the animal's landscape and, and their habitat. Remember the downwind point that I was making, and then understand that on foot it's a low probability. Lower than in safari in Africa where the animals are everywhere, you just drive up to them. But it's therefore more rewarding on foot. When you do see something like the wolf, that is a crazy moment. It's crazy and fun and exciting. Learn as you go. If you're going to make mistakes as you try this and maybe go to the Nalaboki Forest and experience this. Learn from your mistakes. I totally messed up the India trip, but it's okay. I just get better and better and better and study more and more. And it's usually cheaper if you do on foot type trips in the wild. Okay. Safety. I'm going to just go through them quickly, but it's very important to know all these things. So, under no circumstances, do not ever chase an animal, do not ever run, and do not ever put an animal at risk. If you run, the instinct is natural, they're just going to see you as prey. They can't help it. The second you start running away, it's over. It's if it's a predator animal. You never run. <coughs> and don't chase them. Don't feed animals. If you're in a safari jeep and you're doing something like, oh, this one photographer in Belarus said you can lean out the vehicle. I'm going to try it. Check with the guide first, please. Talk to them first. Make sure it's OK with them to lean outside the vehicle. <coughs> you're on foot or even in safari, gee, bring extra food and water. Make sure you have communication tools if you, need, if you have them, like GPS or satellite phones. Um, don't get so lost in the moment that you put yourself in danger. I had a student in South Africa with me. She's like, oh, it's so cute, taking a photo. The leopard was behind a fence, but she's like, it's so cute. It wasn't safari. We were at a, a sanctuary. She's not paying attention. She's taking a photo, and through the hole of the fence comes the leopard's arm. It's paw, and it's grabbing like this. She's clueless. She's like, oh yeah, click, click, click. And I'm running, no, <laughs> you're gonna die, no. So uh, like barely missing. I have it on video because someone else was videotaping. It could have been very bad. The leopard gets a hold, pulls it to the fence, probably major lacerations, maybe even gets teeth through the fence and bites her. So do not get lost in the moment that you don't realize what else is happening around you. Be very safe. Bring your first aid kit. No poisonous animals and plants. Basic uh, safety there. Don't lock eyes with animals, please. That's usually a bad sign. You don't usually want to do that. If I'm in the field and I'm looking for an animal, this is my approach. It's called a meander approach. So I'll look like I'm looking for something. I'll stop for like two minutes without moving. And I'll meander a little more. The animal's right there. I want to get closer, but I'm taking this approach. Like I'm looking for food. I'll stop again. Occasionally I'll take a peek. That's how you want to approach an animal, not like this, straight at it. Uh, this is not, not going to be good. First of all, it'll run away, but if it's a predator, you're in trouble too. 
black bears and, and predator cats. If there's ever some weird situation where you're actually in danger on foot, uh, you want to be as loud as you can be, as big as you can be. Take your shirt off if you can, wave it high. You need to be big, look like a huge mass to the animals. Some people in India bring umbrellas because then they hit the, the button and the umbrella goes whoosh, and it scares the cat away if they're walking near where leopards might be. So it's really important that you know that with black bears and cats, you big and loud and they'll scare it away. But um, with brown bear, polar bear, grizzly bear, play dead. Just fall and play dead. You have no chance. Do not try to scream or yell. Monkeys, be aware. They love to steal things. Don't feed them. It's no good. All right, quiz. Most dangerous animal in Africa is? It is not elephant, although they're very strong and powerful. It's not the rhinoceros, also strength, incredibly hippo, powerful. Hippo. It is the hippopotamus. It kills more people than any other animal in Africa. Things are not what they seem. You might say, oh, the lion's dangerous. There are other animals more dangerous. Second most dangerous animal in Africa, technically an animal. Not a crocodile, well, it's third. No, no, no. It's really small. Mosquito. Because it carries a disease. So things are not what they seem sometimes. You think this animal is really dangerous, or you think this animal is really safe. You never know. It could actually be the opposite of what you think. So study animal behavior ahead of time, like I keep saying. Know what you're getting yourself into. Before I close and open up for questions, I want to give a shout out to a, a wildlife photographer who is, um, his books have been, or one of his books and his videos have been very helpful to me. Steve Perry is his name. I follow him very closely. I have other resources that you see that I've got this information from, but I really want to put a thanks out to Steve Perry. He's a photographer in the US, and I really have appreciated his wildlife tips and suggestions. So that is it for now, and I want to go to a Q&A session now if you have any questions. Yes, sir. Ah, this, no, it's not. <laughs> this is me being a tourist in Africa. I have no idea the story behind it, but it was some craft of uh, a Maasai tribe. A Maasai tribe. One more uh, question, please. Uh, did you have any situations in your practice when you run as fast as you can, saving your life? Wild animals. Thankfully, no. Um, here in the Nalavoki forest, I'm on foot quite a bit. And the thing about this is the animals in the forest here are incredibly scared. So actually on foot, you're gonna scare them, they're gonna run away. Wolf, lynx, um, there's a there's like 12 bears in the Nalavoki forest, and I suppose in the right in, in the wrong situation they might attack you, but otherwise. Uh, usually in the Nalavoki forest, they're very shy yeah, sure. and they stay away. Mm -hmm. I, fortunately, I've never had a situation where I was in danger, but I've studied animal behavior enough to know how to be at least as safe as possible in these scenarios. So that's my recommendation to you. Wherever you're going to go, study the animal behavior and know what you're going to do. For me, in my home state of Washington State, it's cougars, wild cat, big dangerous cat. And I know exactly what I need to do in different scenarios based on what that animal's doing. Yes. Do you shoot snakes, or scorpions, insects? Yes. Um, in the, uh, I won't go back to it, in the Nalaboki slide, there was a black adder, which is a, a poisonous snake here in Belarus. It was a beautiful snake, and it was actually mad at me. I hadn't done anything, it was just I was near it, so I got to get good photos. This is a situation where I was actually directly above it, so it was a decent angle. Um, so it depends on where I'm going. So in Sri Lanka, there's some opportunity with some insects. Um, Belarus, there's definitely some opportunity. I haven't done a lot of insects in Africa because it's mostly mammals that we're taking photos of. But yes, I'm very interested. If you saw the Costa Rica one, there was a few. I went through quickly, but there were some photos of some insects and snakes. In Costa Rica. You maybe saw that one that looked like a leaf. It was uh, just recently in the photo. It looks like a disc. It's actually a, a really cool bug. That looks That is correct. Yes. Yes. I think it's really different. It is, and you have to, 
So you're saying is it, um, insect photography or small animal photography is very different than large mammal. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Absolutely. And the whole composition and story part becomes even more important. Because you can't just move a little bit and change the story. You are bigger than it. And so you have to make micro movements to tell the story that you want. Mm -hmm. so, and knowing its behavior is really important too. I've done some bees from time to time. I really like bee photography, so I've done that. You know, take a photo of any part. Beautiful. If you have the right lens, it can be really cool. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Have you ever used technological contraption like a large camera movement? I have not no. yet. Cool. No drones, no um, uh, Wi Fi connected remote. I haven't. That's cool. So, yeah, just, no, just by right, hand. Yeah, yeah so. That brings up an interesting point, if I may steer it a little bit different directions. Many of my friends say, oh, you always take photos during the safari. You didn't enjoy the experience. And I understand what they're saying. And I know my wife at the beginning when she first started, she had that same resistance. She just enjoyed it and loved it. And I was like, please, can you do video? I can't do both. And I finally convinced her to try. And I think what she was able to articulate and what I definitely articulate is this. I'm still in the moment. In fact, I'm now a participant in the moment. And in terms of composition, when we talked about that at the beginning, I'm actually telling a story within the story that's happening in front of me. So instead of just sitting back in a movie theater, essentially, and just taking it in, I'm actually actively engaged. And maybe I'm even more attentive and focused than most people who are just watching and taking random photos with their cell phones. So I argue that I'm actually not missing the moment. I'm more intense in the moment, more engaged, and I actually have a part in telling the story of the moment. Take that for what it is. I totally respect those people who say, no, no photos, no technology. I just want to enjoy the moment. I respect that. Yes? It's not only a photo, it's your job to play. It is not my job. I am a teacher by trade. So my opportunity to travel around the world is to teach at international schools. And so one of my great passions is animals, wildlife, and photography. Uh, my wife actually first got me into this because I was just a landscape photographer for quite a while. Um, but once I started noticing that landscape is, is, it is what it is, it's sort of um, uh, behaviorless, although sometimes the weather has behavior. But suddenly I realized photographing animals was really interesting because of the behavior study ahead of time and anticipate what they'll do and try to capture that. Moment. So that was far more interesting to me. And so, yeah, it's, it's a hobby at this point. I don't sell any of my photos yet. Maybe in the future I'll do this. I've on purpose kept it for fun. If I start making money, I'm kind of concerned that it will become a job and then I will lose the love of it. Maybe I'll still love it too, but I'm not sure. So right now, just a hobby. Yeah, so you can, uh, through magazines, you can even have just an online website where you can post your photos and people will buy them. You can, can have galleries at different places and post your photos like this for sale. Give a presentation like this and people can buy your photos. Um, you might get hired by a company, like a, a safari company, to come take photos of their wildlife to help promote the company. Different ways. Good questions. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Good question. Good question. So, because of my job, I'm limited by the amount of opportunities I have. Um, <clears throat> I keep saying patience is important. So, you do need to, when you go somewhere, let's say Sri Lanka, I was there for five days in the, for, in the jungle, at least. I, I would say minimum five days to commit to something. Um, so, let's say three to four times a year I go somewhere for a while. I'm moving in a few months to Ethiopia. I've been here for three years, and I'm moving to Ethiopia. This is gonna get me closer in proximity to many of the countries I want to be to do, continue my hobby of wildlife photography. So it's not so much how many times, it's about uh, patience once you're there. Um, because I've, I've been to the Nala Bukit Forest now eight times, and there are times where I have nothing at all. And there's other times where I have great opportunities and see beautiful things. So it's just about taking the opportunity that you have, being patient, calm, relaxed, meditate if you want to, and just enjoy it.
Patience is key. You've got to wait for the animals. They're going to do something. You've got to be patient, though. Some people are patient in the wrong way. So I've seen people on safari crowd around a family of lions. It's 11 a.m. They just drank. What are they going to do all day? The lions. Can you guess? Lay down, relax, and sleep all day. And there's all these jeeps like, woo, and the, they're just sleeping. There's no behavior. There's nothing interesting. So my guide knows this. I know this. He's a photographer and trained. I'm a photographer trained. And we're like, we're out of here. Goodbye. I don't want to see lions laying down. I've seen them before. Let's move on to something really interesting. Let's go, what happens at 11 a.m.? Which animal is interesting to look at? So then we make a decision accordingly. So understanding behavior not only causes you to be patient, but it also causes you to know when to move on. Yes, a question in the back, I think. Yes. Which woman was the most dangerous for you? <clears throat> Okay, I have an example here in Belarus, actually, which is funny because Belarus isn't very dangerous compared to Africa. But uh, I was with uh, this guy, that, by the way, his name is Vadim Sudorovich, an absolute genius and gem and the most precious person in this country. If you have an opportunity, his website is wolfing.info, wolfing.info. He is put his life into this country and the studying animals, lynx and wolf. The most amazing person, really. I, I will forever remember him. And uh, I've spent a lot of time with him in the forest and this, he's mostly a researcher. He's not as interested in wildlife photographers. He's there to do research on the wolves. So one day we were walking around through the forest and we walked like 12, 15 kilometers a day through the marsh and everything and we got to this one point, we were on the edge of a forest and he says, oh, Look at the, uh, the markings and everything. There's bison in the forest. And we had two photographers with us. And he said to the French photographers, you, you go to the clearing over there, this open valley. You wait. Josh and I, we go and we chase bison to you. <laughs> so we go on the far end of the forest. And we start walking through the forest quietly. And all of a sudden, push, push, bison. I'm like, can I get a photo real quick? So I was actually able, in the dark forest, in the evening, to get a photo. It's not worthy of displaying, but it's really interesting. All these trees, and then little sliver, you can see the bison through the trees looking at us. And then he said, are you ready? Yes. He says, let's go. <laughs> so we start chasing the bison. I'm running like crazy. I'm worried I'm going to twist an ankle or something, and we're just, ah. And then the bison starts running. Oh my goodness, there's maybe three or four bison. I don't know how many exactly, but about this many. And the and trees just right through them. And it, so this is probably the, the scariest, but it wasn't dangerous. Again, the, the animals in the forest are scared of me, so I was scaring it. But if it had decided to come back, uh, that would have not been a good experience at all. So that's probably the most dangerous experience with wildlife. Yeah, yeah, right? But I think they would knock the tree down, so I don't know what I'd do in that case. <laughs> yes? Uh, what about uh, like post processing with photos? Right. Like it, it has some specific wildlife photos. Absolutely. So there's so much I want to cover in one night, right? Like the gear is yeah. a conversation we have forever. The settings, this is the conversation we have forever. And, and that's another thing. Do you want to use Lightroom? Do you use Photoshop? Do you just leave it alone? Because ethically, I, I don't want to mess with the photo. Uh, do you crop things out? Do you remove things? So for me, I try to keep things as close as possible to what, what I saw on the camera. I might enhance some color, some saturation, some white balance. I might go in and change some of the settings, but I'm really interested in getting it as it was. So what you're seeing here, for the most part, is very minor touch-ups in the photos. I'm, that's my personal take on it. So, um, <clears throat> and everyone's different. Some other people might see it more as an art after the fact. So they take the photo and then they want to turn it into a piece of art. Great, that's awesome, fantastic. Does that answer your question? Is that where you were going with that question? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No. These photos are as natural as possible. Yes, yes. Again, I would. I'm doing like a saturation increase slightly, and I'm changing maybe a little bit of the white balance. That's Yes? 
No, I don't actually. I'm so busy with my teaching that I don't actually get out and, and see other professionals doing wildlife photography and their work. And I have friends who do this. So I have, for example, a French photographer. His entire life is just wolves. He comes here for three months at a time, talking about patience and how long it takes. So he spends three months here in the Nalaboki Forest with his ghillie suit and he hides for like eight days in one place and hoping to get wolf photos. So he has beautiful galleries all around uh, Europe, and sometimes I see his stuff posted on social media. I don't, uh, don't often have time to just go around and look at other galleries. I wish, I wish I would. And maybe I will do that in the future. Yes? Yes, yes. How do I decide which country? So this is again me studying the animals and targeting. I'm very intentional. So I want leopard. One of the best places to go is Sri Lanka. Next is certain countries in Africa, like Botswana, or Kenya, or Tanzania. Yes, yes, some of these countries have similar animals for sure, but it's about access and behavior. So, in Africa, because of the so many huge predators, like lions, the leopards are harder to get to, because they really hide. Whereas in Sri Lanka, it's a sloth bear, and it's too small to care about the leopards, so the leopard is the apex predator. So they're out, like lions, proudly walking around doing their thing. So it's easier to photograph them. So it's, there's a website called Safari Talk. That's a great resource, by the way. It's all the experts in the world talking about safari photography in all the different locations, sharing their insights, like even on specific camps. Like I stayed at this camp, and here's my recommendation. And they talk about what different animals you can target Yes, sir. Uh, you are working as a teacher, but what uh, subject do you teach exactly? Yeah, yeah, I teach English, high school, so, and sometimes journalism as well. So I've taught uh, four years in America, three years in Kazakhstan, three years here in Belarus, and now I've moved to Ethiopia. Yes? Thank you. Thank you for your story. Of course. So, Right. So you are a creator mm -hmm. of uh, such photography. Um, you obviously want people to see them. Yes. 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 So maybe uh, you are creating stories. Yes. Uh, what is what are your most uh, mm -hmm. uh, favorable stories? What are my favorite you stories? To, to tell us. Yes. Yes. Okay. So there's this. There's, there's great questions. So the question is, what are the stories I want to tell of my photography? Is that correct? Yes. So there's the crazy side of you that's like, I want the most grotesque, insane, intense, bloody shots, right? I want to see animals at their most intense. And then there's other times where I say, I want to see especially sibling interaction. I'm really interested in young animals interacting with each other because they, what they display is very playful, sometimes aggressive. It's very interesting that they, they try to mimic their parents. Baby cheetahs, or you know, cubs, are really cute. They even climb trees. Most people don't know that cheetah cubs climb trees. And they like chase like squirrels around the tree and then they come back down. It's super interesting. Um, so I would say relationships and or intensity is the main thing I'm trying to tell them. So in South Africa, I've worked with some volunteer uh, agencies there. In fact, I took students from here, and we went to South Africa last year, and we worked there with, with these organizations. Um, 
I do want to attract photographers into my life. But at the same time, I'm hesitant. I mean, I'm part of the problem. There's just too many of us. And tourism's good for the country, for the people. But at the same time, you go to a place like India, and you see a queue of 100 jeeps waiting to see a tiger. And it just makes me say, wow, I don't want to sell my photos and put them out there so much that people want to. But then again, I put YouTube videos up of, of animals. You saw the video as you were coming in. Um, but I haven't done anything in terms of activism yet. I haven't, maybe when I go to Ethiopia, I'll start connecting with specific organizations doing activism, and then the idea planted in me is a good idea moving forward. Not necessarily. You can do something else. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you. For that. Did you write something about animals? No writing for me. Um, for me, the... the for me, the story is the picture. I've done some writing. If you go to wolfing.info, I've published three stories on his website, specifically this story as well. So I do some writing. But uh, I do so much writing for my job <laughs> that I don't get a lot of time for creative writing. But thank you, because now I have some ideas bouncing around. Very good. Yes? Yes, yes. What are things you like and maybe what are things you think are strange or weird or Okay. <laughs> All right. Good question. So the one thing I chose Belarus on purpose. I had many different countries I could choose from. I chose Belarus for a couple reasons. One was I knew from people I talked to that it was a place that was calm and genuine. People were genuine with each other and it was calm. And I had been in Kazakhstan, and I was just doing all these projects, just crazy. I was so busy, and I was just like, ah, time out, I need a break. And Belarus has been that place for me. It's a place where I've been able to relax more and rest and reflect. So I've been very appreciative of that. Like Sunday morning, if I get up and walk around, it's, oh, this is amazing. I'm in the city, and I have to whisper. Whereas where I'm going in Ethiopia, 7 million people, 8 a.m., Cars and horns and dogs and concrete jungle and crazy. So I really appreciated quietness. I have so many uh, colleagues at my school, local people that I've connected with, who have been so good to me and forgiven me when I've made crazy mistakes in the culture here. And uh, I've gone on some really cool trips. One of my colleagues, <coughs> colleagues is standing back here. <coughs> A master photographer in his own right. And he and I went to Kamchatka together, actually, just uh, Sasha and I, and that was a fantastic experience. So um, I, I've loved the Belarusian people enough to say, I'm sorry, my wife, I'm not going on vacation with you, I'm going on vacation with someone else. <laughs> with a guy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, the people, the calm, quiet. Uh, you guys eat a lot of mushrooms. <laughs> and I didn't like them, but now I eat them. And I like them, but boy, was it hard. Like, that's not a food that I really like. This, like, fungus that grows in the ground that's mushy. Yeah, no, no, no. But I've come to like them, actually, and, and my wife can testify to this. I do eat some mushrooms. So that was something that was weird to me. All the mushrooms are weird. McDonald's had mushrooms on the menu, for goodness sakes. <laughs> Good questions. Any other last ones? Yes. Okay, so, I need to categorize this. It's not an easy answer. Kenya is my favorite because of the animals and the landscape. And I've actually been in many, many, many places, toured the whole country. But, Belarus has been my favorite for the experience because to see this in the wild is a million, one in a million chance. And Africa, to see lions is very easy. It just drive to them. So there's not a lot of, it. it's exciting, but it's not like you worked hard to get to that. This took me weeks and three years to get this moment. And so Belarus has provided more of the challenge. In terms of my favorite overall safari experience, Sri Lanka. The smells, the variety of animals, 
the density of the jungle. I have this video I made, it's five hours of just the sounds. I put my recorder outside my tent and just hit record. Because it's just the cacophony of noise, just beautiful symphony of sound. And I work to it, I hit it play and I work in the background and hear it and I'm whisted away to this to this beautiful scenery. So Sri Lanka is sort of far away, but if you could go to Sri Lanka and it's cheaper than going to Africa, I would recommend it for sure. Uh, safari there. And speaking of uh, avoiding crowds, they have five sections in their park, and only three are open to tourists, and almost all the tourists go to block one, the first section. And I asked my guide ahead of time, why do they go there? Oh, because there's a lot of bears. I said, let's go somewhere else where they are not. Let's go to the other blocks where the tourists aren't. We can get a bear if we want, whatever, but let's avoid the crowds. That's more important. So we went to the other blocks and had amazing experiences. They were incredible, like five total Jeeps in the whole stinking park the whole day. So I think it was a really good decision to avoid the crowds and to go to the less traveled to spots, so long as there's still animals there. Sorry, I went off track for a minute, but yes. So Kenya, if you want to see the animals, Belarus, if you want the challenging experience, and Sri Lanka, if you want the overall safari experience. It's just enchanting. I suffer from the disease called monolingualism. <laughs> I only speak one language right now. I'm working on it. My wife is, uh, her family is Swedish, and we are practicing Swedish right now and trying to study Swedish because we have relatives that we can Skype with and practice. So I'm, I'm working on Swedish. So it, Kazakhstan's. They speak Russian, three years there, three years here. It's actually very embarrassing that I did not learn Russian. I know very little. The reason why is my school, everything is English. My friends, everything's English. After work, I go with people who are speaking English. So I live in a bubble, and I didn't make an intention to get outside the bubble and learn Russian. I so. Swahili, yes. Uh, I want to learn Swahili but I have not learned it. By the way, on that note, it'd be it, um, if you have a good relationship with your guide, you can ask your guide ahead of time, what are the, the secret words that they use for the animals? Because they don't use the actual Swahili words, because everyone knows what these, what these words are for the animals, like lion. Uh, what is it in Swahili? What is lion? Yeah, 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 yeah. yes. I forget. Anyway, they're, they're common words that we know, and so they have other, like, like secret words that they use. And then when they're talking on the radios. Simba for elephants. Yes, yes, yes. Simba, so. The lion, and, and so they use other words so that the tourists don't get, like, hopeful, and then you arrive and it's gone. So they don't want the tourists to know the, the secret words. So I always ask my guide ahead of time, this week, what are the secret words? Last question. How much do you pay for safari? So, there's a huge range. There's the really rich people who go there to have wine and red carpet and they spend ridiculous amounts of money. Your flight is going to be something like, I've had as cheap as like $650 round trip to South Africa and back from here. Um, you just have to be careful in looking for ticket prices and, and constantly, consistently looking. Let's say on average you're going to spend something like $800 round trip to Kenya and back. Uh, your lodging, in my opinion, I'm not going there to have a nice apartment or, or hotel or, or a tent. I don't care. I'm leaving at 4 a.m. anyway. I'm going to go see the animals. So the tent is going to be as basic as possible. I don't need to be pampered. I'm, I'm there for animals. So I go the cheapest possible on the tent and then I, I spend more money on a good guy. Let's say you're gonna spend something like, in Africa, $3,000 for a week. US dollars, let's say 3,000 for, for there. India, maybe a little bit less. And uh, now Laboki, well, it's the cost of driving there and staying with uh, the professor. And so it's, uh, I think he's something around the lines of 100 euro per day, something like this, which is still very expensive, but man, the experience you're going to have with him, 
It's not just Safari. It's knowledge. It's research. It's training. And he gives you the whole package. It's awesome. It's like a skill station. So it could it could be a lot. It could be twelve thousand dollars. It could be three thousand. It could be probably a spend on a weekend here, three days. I probably spend something like four hundred dollars for me to go to Nagoki. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> so I don't have very many wildlife photos from Kazakhstan, so I didn't bring those with me. But I have tons of them on my card here. Uh, if you want to come by and grab it, I have a link to our website where all my photography is, and I have a lot of Kazakhstan photos because it is a beautiful country. Canyons and mountains, and oh, it's gorgeous. So I have a ton of photos of Kazakhstan. Yeah. And uh, in Sweden, there, uh, there is a, North. a yeah, there is a zoo. Sort of natural, yes. Have you been there, and what is the difference between? I have not been there. I have not been there, um, but I've been to Sweden a few times. Our next trip to Sweden, I think, is to be way up north. Her relatives have a cabin up in, in the northern territory, and so we'll actually get to interact with the actual wild animals. And uh, you don't there, except for bison. Uh, Maybe very similar. To the yes, yes. It's it's like a bison. Do you know the name of it? Up north, I forget the name of it. It's not a bison, though, but it's a similar type of animal. And they have uh, some wolf, and they have bear, lots of bear, and lots of deer and elk. So we do planning. Yes, we are planning to go up north and uh, do wildlife targeting. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. uh, what is the Yes, yes. I don't know. I don't know, because I love teaching. I'd like to keep doing teaching and the opportunity to, to have a hobby and teach is really a good thing for me. Um, maybe in the future, maybe when I retire, for example, I would do only wildlife photography. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. Maybe one more more question before we we need to wrap it up. Yes. When did you yeah, so my first interest was in videography way back when I was in high school. And then uh, my wife's mother, my mother in law, is a professional photographer. She always told me, oh, photos, photos. I'm like, oh, boring. I like videos, it's, it's like a live. And then um, my wife convinced me to try safaris, and our first one was India. And I, and I was doing landscape photography already in Kazakhstan. And then we go on safari and like tigers right next to me and I said, oh my God, this is a whole different realm. I'm, I'm totally hooked. So it was video to landscape and now wildlife photography. We still do videos. We do a lot of videos on YouTube of uh, our different safari experiences and other travel videos too. So, and that's on the, on the card. Okay. Thank you so very much uh, for coming out and hearing this. You're welcome to take a look. I'm also going to play as we're going the, the video again that some of you saw when you first came in. So you can see the video if you want to stay for a few more minutes of, of our experience. And the video is done by. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.